So I'm Peter Bergen, and uh, I'll be moderating this discussion. Um, in addition to Rosa, who uh, until is a professor at Georgetown and worked in the Defense Department in the pol policy shop until relatively recently, we have on the far right Phil Mudd, who had a distinguished career at the CIA. He was the deputy director of the Counterterrorism Center for much of the period after 9-11. He then uh, joined the FBI, basically setting up uh, really the intelligence capability of the FBI, <coughs> which it not really <coughs> had in the pre-9-11 era. Uh, he's now a banker strangely, uh, in, <laughs> um, but we know, we know he'll be very good at that. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's also uh, Doug Olivant. Doug had a distinguished career in the US military. He, uh, he wrote the battle plan for Baghdad in 2007, which became known as the Surge. He uh, then was NSC director in the White House uh, for Iraq. He became a senior counterinsurgency advisor in eastern Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so we have a very good group here. I'll start with you, Rosa. <clears throat> Obviously, in December of 2014, we're going to remove combat troops from Afghanistan. The reason you were testifying is everybody's aware of that. And the, that would be the sort of inflection point where you say, hey, this authorization for the use of military force that we voted on 13 years ago is either now defunct, uh, over, we're not in a, we're not in a warlike situation, uh, or you know, let's revise it, and liberals want to, I think liberals want to revise it, they want to kind of constrain it and say, there shouldn't be this expansive thing that you just described. But I think the mood in Congress, as far as I can tell, is a lot of people are saying, actually, we should make this bigger. We should, because the, the way it was written initially, as you know, was it's about the people who attacked us on 9-11. Well, there's some people that we would like to now go after who aren't really involved in that. And so we should actually name more groups and make this a much bigger thing. So have, what, you know, based on your you know, recent testimony, and the mood there, where do you think this thing is going? I don't know where it's going, Peter. Uh, am I still? Okay, yeah. you can still hear me. Uh, I think I'm now sitting on my microphone's apparatus, but <laughs> this can't be good. Um, um, I don't know where it's going, because I think that, I think that you have two distinct groups on the Hill, um, one uh, in, both in terms of substance and in terms of what you might call the separation of powers issues. Um, in terms of substance, yes, there's definitely a group that would like to see this expanded to enable the U.S. to continue to regard itself domestically as legally in armed conflict with, you know, any still unimagined future group of bad guys who might have nothing to do with Al-Qaeda or 9-11 who might pop up to threaten us. Equally, there, however, there is a group that's saying, whoa, not a good idea. Um, not a good idea for at potentially at least three reasons. You know, one would be a sort of strategic reason of, uh, is it actually ultimately, this is the Rumsfeld question, are we creating terrorists faster than we can kill them? Is this a good idea? Is it going to get us to wherever it is we want to go? Second issue being uh, separation of powers. Um, the more you know, Congress, you hand a sort of open-ended authorization to have an armed conflict uh, to the executive branch, that's a power you're not very likely to get back. Why not say if you have a very specific threat, uh, Mr. President, you come back to us and you ask for a very specific tailored authorization to use force against that threat that does have a sunset clause. Uh, and, then, and then I think the, 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 the third point, which has got some traction, and I, how this is going to play out, I have no idea. I don't know. Lorelei understands Congress, and I sure don't. Um, but but the, you know, the third way that some are approaching this, and interestingly, the administration seems to be approaching it this way too, uh, is that uh, under both domestic constitutional law principles and international law, the president already has the inherent power to use military force to protect the United States against any imminent threat. So nobody disputes that there may be still unimagined new threats out there or that will emerge, but that's, you know, that's why we, have the, we give the president the latitude to use force and self-defense in emergencies. But that, that, that legal framework has kind of a higher threshold. You have to show the threat is actually imminent and has some gravity before you can use force. So, so how that's all going to play out, I, I don't know. I, In his public comments, President Obama has basically used that argument. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and, and it seems that the actual victims of the drone strikes are not people who are posing an imminent th threat by any kind of reasonable standard. They are like lower, lower level members of the Taliban. So I think there's been a kind of... When President Obama's talked about it, I think he's talked about it in a way that seems, you know, easy to understand, but isn't really what's happening. Is that is that your assessment? My sense is that they are mixing and matching the self-defense type of argument with the law of armed conflict type of argument, uh, and to the you know, you don't they don't need to be imminent threats for you to go after them if it's an armed conflict. 
Uh, so they pick and choose uh, depending on which is, which is more convenient. But that, certainly factually, that's my sense, although my colleagues may have a better sense than I do. I think the most interesting thing of what Rosa brought up is how this has created perverse incentives inside the entire security structure. Um, there's a joke going around the interagency now that I think captures this, that DIA wants to be CIA. You know, they've made a big push now to develop more human intelligence sources. Um, CIA wants to be JSOC. You know, the, the CIA has a very robust um, capability, is, is a very poorly kept secret. Um, JSOC wants to be DOD. You know, Admiral McRaven has made a big point about getting his tentacles, well, that, that's putting it not neutrally, <laughs> about putting command and control centers out around the world that, do, that respond to him and not to the, through the normal chain of command. Um, and as Rosa pointed out, DOD wants to be state. You know, they are doing all these you know, not traditionally non-military What does state want to be? And state <laughs> is just hoping not to become USAID. Um, <laughs> so it, it really has created these perverse incentives that are pushing people outside their traditional lanes because, um, as you point out, this, this, this puts us in a really unusual set of affairs where everything becomes a warfare activity and therefore all the institutions have to readjust how they behave. Well, Phil, as somebody who sat at the CIA where a lot of this, as this unfolded, um, a critique of the CIA today is that, um, as a for instance, you know, it was, it was not possible to predict the date of the Egyptian revolution when, uh, when it happened. But it might have been predictable that the Salafists would get 25% of the vote. And I don't think the agency saw that coming, uh, as far as I can tell. So that the CIA's main sort of traditional role <coughs> of providing strategic warning to policymakers of really important political developments in the world has been lost in this. Uh, they've got into the business of just killing people. And that has sort of deformed the central <coughs> role of the agency. Is that an accurate kind of critique? I think there are some valid critiques, but I, I think they're miscast a bit. And there, there are two in particular I'd be thinking about. The first is on strategic intelligence and strategic analysis, which is what I grew up on. My sense, and I feel as strong, I shouldn't use the word sense, I believe the intelligence community and the CIA do not recognize that the world has transitioned from a world of secrets to a world of knowledge, where from Google Earth, if you're looking at a North Korean facility or if you're looking at Iranian revolution, or the Green Revolution, or if you're looking at what happened in Egypt, the, the analysts there still struggle to live in a world where that knowledge is freely available and where your capability to learn isn't constrained by secrets. The second, to get to your point, is this, this talk about the, the balance or lack of balance between strategic analysis and tactical information. I, I think in the 21st century, with the digital trail that all of us leave in this room, the same digital trail that a cartel guy might leave, that a human trafficker or a sex trafficker might leave, that the thirst for tactical intelligence that allows you to find, fix, and finish a target that is a human being and to draw a picture around that target that is so good that you can pick them up or kill them, that people who talk about that as a terrorism capability aren't understanding. I think that is a revolutionary capability that should be applied in concert with strategic analysis to things like Mexican cartels and sex traffickers. Um, just to change the subject a little bit, um, the most successful al-Qaeda affiliate in the world right now is in Syria. And they seem to have learned from the mistakes of al-Qaeda in Iraq. In fact, they are al-Qaeda in Iraq. They're not imposing Taliban-style rule on the population. They're the most effective fighting force against Assad. Um, you had to deal with that a lot, yeah. Doug, when you were in Iraq and obviously Phil. So tell us how you see this playing out. Are they going to make the same set of mistakes that will eventually cause the population to turn against them? Um, have they, are they going to develop into a Hezbollah-like uh, entity that actually is behaving in a political manner, or is it impossible to tell? Go ahead, please. I think it's very, very difficult to tell what the relationship is between al-Nusra al and AQI. Are they, are they essentially the same organization? Are they two organizations side by side that are linked? Is one subordinate to the other? Um, that's not entirely clear. That. Uh, the uh, AQI Amir, um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is reported yesterday to have moved to North Syria to direct the fight from there. But whether he's just directing al-Qaeda in Iraq inside Syria or whether he's responsible for that entire, the entire jihadist wing of the uh, Syrian fighting force and then what, how, what percentage of the fighting force is AQI al-Nusra and, and what, are the, what of the Arab moderates um, 
this is just remarkably unclear. I, th I think, you know, and it gets, I thought Rose's comments were really brilliant. I want to tie that into this for a second, but I, I, I hate to let the past dictate the future, but I have not seen since Algeria and Egypt in the 90s, looking at Zarqawi in Iraq, that violent Salafis, despite what they say, have the capability to reform. That is to say, unless we figure out a way to accommodate people who don't think like we are, we're just going to shoot ourselves in the foot. It happens every single time. So as an analyst, you have to say, when is that going to change? <clears throat> I'm not sure it will, because obviously embedded in the ideology is not only are we right, but we're right because you have to be people of the book. How can you be something else? But to Rose's point, it, you know, if I were still in the business, I, I would be very uncomfortable with this. The oppressive nature of threat and the unknown in 2002 at the threat table, which I sat at every night, it, it, oppressive daily, the sense of the unknown was pervasive. When will anthrax hit New York? When will the next plane come down? And so to contrast in terms of how we define our society, to suggest today that we should view the takedown of two cargo aircraft, for example, in Yemen, as at that same level of threat, to me, is an immature culture, to be blunt, that cannot accommodate risk. We say we're tough, we're not. But as a political matter, I mean, we can all agree that that's true. But as a political matter, whether it's uh, President Hillary Clinton or President Jeb Bush or choose your president, to say, look, you know, we, we've made the assessment that this problem is not a particularly big one. Um, and we're going to kind of dismantle much of this national security apparatus, whether it's legal or physical, uh, because we're moving on. The political cost of then having an attack that could be any, in any way construed to be linked to these groups would be enormous. I mean, look at the political cost of, of a near miss on Christmas Day 2009. So I think, you're, I, think, you know, I think the analysis is right, but as a political matter, it's very hard to make the argument and, and sort of succeed as a politician. No, I, I think that's right. I think the real forward-looking conversation might be we have now proven a tremendous capability to intervene in places where we don't even have a footprint. And so you could look at Yemen, you could look at the destruction of the Al-Shabaab foreign-focused leadership in Somalia. I think the forward-looking conversation is, as a country, if we have that capability between having no presence and big green, when we're looking at threat, do we want to move against leadership before they moved against us if we think they're plotting, or do we want to wait till they hit us? What is intervention if we have this new tool to say intervention might be going against the leadership of a group and you don't have to commit U.S. forces? That's an interesting question. I wonder why we don't ask that more about cartels. They're a bigger threat than terrorism. Well, what is your assessment of the al-Qaeda and related threat? I mean, on a scale of, let's say, if 9-11 was a 10, what would you give it now? You're talking about the core or the entire revolutionary movement? Both the core and the sort of uh, the, the whole core movement. is one or two. The movement, I'd give a three, but that the, volatil the volatility of the first, that is the al-Qaeda architects, I think is limited. They don't have much of a future. The volatility of the revolutionary um, elements in northern Nigeria or Mali, et cetera, to me, is that could go to a six tomorrow. It depends on the vision of leadership and their ability to access safe haven that gives them time and space to plot. Doug, you were, uh, you know, your, one of your big jobs was being a military planner. What are the uh, pitfalls and, and, and possibilities of a no-fly zone in Syria, ext extending from a complete no-fly zone to a, just a smaller no-fly zone in the, in the north? Um, any no-fly zone requires you to take down the air defense network. Any capable... You know, Totalitarian, authoritarian dictator puts his air defense networks in the middle of places that will cause huge civilian casualties when and if it's attacked. So to set up a, a no-fly zone is a could be done relatively quickly with U.S. air power. The lack of a legal mandate for that, of course, is very complicated. Um, it could be done very quickly, very violently, but at uh, great civilian cost. On the, on the legal matter, I mean, do we... And, and, and then the question is, does that, then what does that buy you? Okay. And then if that doesn't work, what do we do now? Maintaining a no-fly zone is a very expensive proposition, um, requires a lot, of, a lot of fuel, a lot of man hours. Putting planes up in the air 24-7 is very, very expensive. And we take away uh, you know, Assad's air power and the condition on the ground changes not particularly very much. Because? because he's not particularly using, air power is not his qualitative advantage. What, what is his qualitative? I think right now it's Hezbollah. 
Um, Rosa, in terms of the legal framework, um, can you, we do a no-fly zone in Syria without a UN authorization? My understanding is that you, there was one in Kosovo, which was a NATO uh, only, but obviously this is not. Is that a legal question or is that a question of, a, of can we? Sure. Yeah. Uh, should we? Um, I don't know. I'm really conflicted about this. Yes, in Kosovo, NATO used military force without a UN Security Council authorization. Um, I think that if we, if we came to the conclusion that a military intervention of some sort, whether it's a no-fly zone or troops on the ground or special operations forces on the ground or who knows, including maybe even arming the rebels may present the same legal issue, um, what I think we would probably uh, ha have to argue, um, in Kosovo we didn't argue anything, we just kind of looked away and you know, hummed whenever anybody mentioned the question, but what we'd, we would argue probably, A, something related to Hezbollah's increasing role in the threat to Israel and threats to U.S. persons, um, linked to Hezbollah and other groups, um, maybe even al-Nusra. Um, and B, we would argue that uh, the use of force is unlawful without a Security Council act only if the sovereign state doesn't consent. And we would argue that Assad is no longer the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. The Arab League has given its seat, has given Syria's seat already to the uh, uh, Syrian National Council Council coalition, I get them mixed up, so that somebody else who knows more about Syria can correct me. Um, uh, we, the, more than 100 nations, including the US, have recognized that as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. So we would essentially say, you know, we have consent from the those who now matter, uh, and that would be our legal argument. A um, little shaky, maybe, but not crazy. Um, but can I actually just go back to an earlier point about the, the risk from global terrorism to the United States and the politics of talking about it. Now, easy for me to say because I'm, I'm not president uh, and my election doesn't depend on whether I irritate people. Um, God bless tenure, going back to our previous discussion. Um, um, but, but I think it's, it's just lack of political leadership and, and I, think, I think that our leaders have consistently under, underestimated the intelligence and the grit of the American public that, that we, I think Americans were smart enough to ask themselves the question when Boston was shut down because of one teenager for <clears throat> a day to say, wait a second, this is nuts. You know, to say, the, 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 with the exception of 9-11 of, of 2001, in, in a typical year, terrorists worldwide kill fewer Americans than are killed by lightning strikes. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it. You know, that's, 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 that's enough people to really care and to really worry and certainly given given the availability of uh, more lethal forms of technology out there in the world, we do need to absolutely be vigilant. But, but I, th I actually think that no, the, our political leaders have never sought to say to Americans, hey, let's keep this in perspective. We have survived, you know, it's not, the question should not be on a scale of one to 10 with 9-11 being 10, where are we now? The question should be on a scale of existential threat, you know, with nuclear war, being 10, where are we now? And that's a really different kind of question. I actually think Americans are smart enough to give a pretty different answer. Well, Boston, I think, did supply an answer, but the only way you can have that answer supplied is if something happens. I mean, you can't tell if a society is resilient unless an event happens. And I think that I think the response to Boston was relatively resilient. Uh, Phil, how would you score the FBI's handling of Tamerlane, uh, the elder brother who, after all, was flagged by the Russians as a potential threat I, in, in some of the previous events that I witnessed and testified on, for example, Fort Hood, I thought there were things to learn, and there, was, there were some significant lessons learned and pain points in the Fort Hood event. I can't find significant lessons learned in Boston and in, in, in doing a lot of media about that. The, the questions I got were immediately went toward, what's the easy way to explain this, sort of put it in a box and put it in the closet so we can categorize it? Look where, look where our security services are buffoons, fix it and move on. But if, if you have a couple of kids who aren't on the grid very much and vulnerable to people like me in my old life, that is email, phone, travel, talking to the wrong, I need a vulnerability. And they want to create what is, the word sophisticated used to, toward Boston, you couldn't get farther from a sophisticated event from start to finish, every step was unsophisticated. If, that, if that's the level that you want to reach in the volume of threat I witnessed, we need to have a conversation that says we just can't get to that level. And I'm not sure there's a, there's a fix. 
Uh, just a quick question on the AP uh, story, um, the leak of the Yemen operation, as somebody who was both at the agency and the bureau. Um, you know, Rosa used this interesting idea of lawful but awful. I mean, clearly the DOJ is within its legal rights to do what it did. But was this, uh, you know, a sort of unreasonable fishing expedition? Did they lose common sense? I was surprised by it, I confess, because you know, the leaks that we had at both the agency and bureau were legion. It happened all the time. And you'd sit around the, the, uh, the, the coffee machine and say, you know, there's a solution to this, and that is, in even the most secret programs I witnessed, you're going to have several hundred people at a minimum. You can't find that needle in a haystack. So the solution would be, yeah, find the journalist's phone records. And of course, we'd all say, I'm not holier now. There was no consideration that I recollect that said, okay, let's go do that. So my question is not whether the AP leak was that significant. My question was, and, and frankly, I, I would be highly critical of the way the media has handled this. My question is, do we think that when someone breaks the law and breaks the oath that I took, that that's an appropriate, uh, that, that protecting that person by not going after the journalist is appropriate? Now, the answer may well be it is, but all I see covered now is, you know, you're, you're going after our sources and freedom of speech. That source just broke the law. But you're saying that when you were in the government that common sense would dictate that you wouldn't do a sort of fishing expedition for a lot of journalists who Well, were it's not a fishing expedition. You know who the journalist is, and presumably somebody's calling in to say, I want to talk to you at, you know... Well, I mean, just a you know, they, they, were, they looked at the Hartford Bureau, the AP, which is where one of the reporters had worked five years ago. It seemed like a pretty expansive definition of... I mean, and also, you're just, from your, just to clarify, from your own experience, it, that was not a road that you would have gone down. I can't you, imagine anybody proposing that. Okay. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's, I don't, something has happened here, and I'm not quite certain what it is. But again, the AP story is part of a bigger debate we need to have about whether leaking is acceptable as a way, if we want to protect the right of journalists to have sources. It's not whether somebody picked up 200 phone records from the AP. That's too small. Okay. Doug, you just got back from Iraq. You've spent okay. a, a good chunk of your uh, recent, uh, the last decade in Iraq. Give us a sense of the prognosis there. There's still clearly, clearly a lot of political turmoil and a lot of violence. Um, I think your, your outlook on Iraq depends on what you think is the root problem in Iraq. If you think that right now the root problem in Iraq is the government's authoritarianism, then I think you're very pessimistic about the future because that's clearly not changing. If you think the root problem in Iraq is that there's a very active AQI franchise that is routinely blowing up large groups of Shia civilians, which then look to their political leaders and say, do something. The political leaders then, you know, lacking a precision capability, go up and round up the usual suspects, not unlike we did our first, you know, three, four, five years in Iraq. Um, this then creates a uh, you know, hostility in the Sunni population because they're being picked on, although you know, that is, you know, you, you go find AQI in the Sunni population, you don't find them in the Turkmen. Um, so they go pick them up, and then this creates this whole political turmoil. If you think that AQI is the root cause here, that is theoretically fixable. You, know, you can build capacity in the Iraqi government that allows them to do better explosives detection. You know, they, they finally put the guy who sold these imaginary wands in jail, and the Iraqis actually played a huge part in that, um, which was slightly encouraging. Um, if you get some real explosive detection, if you help them to build a intelligence fusion-like capability where they can be more precise in what they're doing, um, then there's some cause for optimism. If, if you think, as some of our colleagues do, that the root cause is Maliki, then, then, then the outlook is bad. Let's uh, throw it open to questions. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, recently, there's been a lot of discussion about cyber wars, especially with China in the press. Um, has the, have the policy makers really been thinking about this very in a serious manner? How does it play into the bigger theme of everything's war and who's going to take charge of this anti-cyber war effort? Well, U.S. Cyber Command is going to take charge of this uh, cyber war effort. And even in a time of military austerity, they are expounding exponentially, like tenfold over the next uh, two to three years. So that's where the focus is. Um, you know, now, whether that's the right focus, whether that's the right agency, whether they have the right, you know, do we really want to use a military approach to what is largely a 
intellectual property rating problem. Mm -hmm. um, these are these are all open questions. But I think the answer to who's going to do it is it's U.S. Cyber Command. How much? I mean, when you were the policy planning shop in, in in Defense Department, how much of that was occupying? Your time, or the... uh, not that much was occupying my time, but but it was certainly occupying the time of many of my colleagues uh, very extensively. I, it, it's, I, I I think it's it's obviously something people worry about enormously because as we grow, as we more and more take advantage of the opportunities presented by uh, uh, electronic forms of networking and interconnectedness, uh, we also grow far more vulnerable to just disruption. That 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 that. If you shut off, uh, and, and you know this is something Doug can speak to far more than I, but it, but if you if you shut off the ability of of troops in the field to communicate or get information that comes from uh, surveillance platforms, or you know, we've got a huge problem, and 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 our our systems, as they become more sophisticated technologically, they be, they become vulnerable in new ways as well. So so at every level, both the the tactical level and the th thinking in terms of things like, well, what if a terrorist group decided to, you know, hack into U.S. infrastructure systems and destroy a dam or something like that? I, I think people are very worried about it. I, I think that Doug is absolutely right. It's, it's, we are, nevertheless, we still have a choice. Do we see this solely or primarily through a military and war frame, or should we instead see this through some different lens, uh, which will have implications for who responds, what set of constraints there are in responding, whether we think when we shift from defense to offense, uh, what, what do we think about collateral damage in the context of counterattacks in the cyber world, about attribution, and so on. It presents that same set of conundrums that I was talking about earlier. And on that level, I think we are only we are only, well, while we are well advanced in establishing a sort of a, a, a institutional infrastructure to focus on cybersecurity and cyber attack, we are only at the very beginning of thinking about what is a sort of legal and conceptual framework for thinking about this. Another big conceptual uh, pr uh, thing at the Pentagon right now, Doug, is, is the question of what kind of war in general are we going to be fighting? Uh, is, it a, is it a war against China that's a sort of uh, naval battle? Is it uh, sort of a more like a Syria contingency operation? I was, I was about to add, I think this is, you know, it plays into this larger issue of, you know, what, what do we need to look at and the, what I would call the defense industrial complex's villainization of China. You know, if China didn't invent, they'd have to invent it. <laughs> um, if it didn't exist, they'd have to invent it because you, you need something to go after. You need something to justify high price toys. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you can't have a Good old-fashioned shooting war in the South China Sea. Where can you have one? You're kind of running. <laughs> you're kind of running out of battlefields to have very seriously. You're running out of first-tier opponents to have serious wars against. Um, you know, you, you, can you really justify? You know, ten, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of Pentagon stand, spending to you know to fight Somali pirates, or you know to defend against the rise of you know Brazil. Um, <laughs> You, know, you, you need a large bogeyman that presents, you know, and, and that has a, you know, its own certain militaristic class that is happy to provide harsh rhetoric in turn. You know, the, you know, the, the very nationalist wing of the Chinese political system is, is happy to play tit for tat with, uh, you know, considering the West to be some kind of villain, even though, as, you know, the ambassador was stating last night, you know, China has zero history of moving outside its traditional territories. You know, it's never invaded China. You know, they came to North Korea, but then left. Um, they, they have no history of being an expansionist power, and yet we insist on treating them that way. And orienting, you know, building a Navy and an Air Force uh, that can go fight that. When I think that it's very clear the future is places like Syria, um, like, you know, like Africa, like the, the, the rest of North Africa. There are all kinds of these places, um, as a friend of mine put it, do you really think the problem is an order that you don't like, as in China, or do you think the problem is just disorder, whether it's from a state that's collapsed or just a place that never had a state in the first place, um, with Iraq being a clear example of the first, Afghanistan a clear example of the second? Amory? Thank you. Uh, so just a, uh, another response on the legal question, and Rosa uh, and I w could debate this as international lawyers, but one possibility is the responsibility to protect original commission 
recommended that uh, responsibility to protect these decisions not be subject to the veto. Uh, because by definition, if, if you meet the threshold where a government is murder, massacring its own people, crimes against humanity, genocide, systematic war crimes, uh, nobody should be able to veto action for political interests. And Kosovo is arguably the first step. I would argue that if we were to act subject to multilateral approval by a regional organization, I, I don't think we should act unilaterally, but if you get the Arab League to vote with us, and as you got NATO to vote for Kosovo, you can, if you keep doing it, establish a customary international law exception uh, to the, the current UN Charter. And that's one, you know, international law is made by breaking it. Uh, and so that's, <laughs> that's, it is. I mean, that's, that's how you ultimately make new law. Uh, so that's just one other legal argument. I, I, I agree with you, Amory, absolutely, subject to a caution. Um, which again, it's not a legal caution. It's a, it's a, what precedents do we set that kick in in, in other ways? I actually think it's, it's. Uh, I believe sovereignty should not be a cloak that governments use to abuse their own people, and 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 that the set of arbitrary constraints related to Security Council voting rules should should not be what stands in the way of of morality and good policy. I also, however, have been very interested in watching the ways in which the discussion of the responsibility to protect, which is premised on the idea, if you will, that sovereignty is a is a privilege, not a right, that you you earn sovereignty uh, by protecting your people, um, has sort of dovetailed in in interesting and often in our unarticulated ways with the sort of U.S. counterterrorism legal logic that sovereignty is also a privilege that you lose if you harbor terrorists inside of, if you become unwilling or unable. So I, I worry that every time we say, uh, as sometimes perhaps we should, uh, the Security Council can go to hell um, because the right thing to do to protect human beings is to intervene uh, on a responsibility to protect basis if their own sovereign government is unwilling or unable to do so, that we also add fuel to arguments that say uh, the Security Council can go to hell if we, the United States, and some group of other states assembled by us uh, decides that a government is unwilling or unable to deal with a, a threat that we define as severe and, and maybe nobody else does. So my concern is not, is, is I, 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 I absolutely agree with you and I'm not, but I don't know what set of constraints we have that replaces that old idea of sovereignty. So. So I worry a little about the unintended consequences, even at the same time that I'm very much in sympathy with your with your logic. I, I actually had a question for Doug, but I uh, so Doug, I, I I'm really interested in your answer on the terrors, the anti-air defenses, because I haven't heard anybody from the administration say the reason we're not doing it is we're going to kill more civilians. Uh, than, than we might save. No one said that. What the administration just says is, oh, we're going to lose planes. That's a far more convincing argument, I think, the way you made it. But I want to ask you what your solution in Syria is. I mean, what would you do? Would you just let it burn itself out? I'm not, this isn't a confrontational. I actually, I really want to want to know. I mean, if, if I had an answer, do? I should have all your old jobs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, as I tell people, you know, I, I spent two years on the ground in, in Iraq. I've, I've spent a year in Afghanistan. I, I worked in you know, national security. And, and this is what, Syria is what we professionals call a mess. Um, it's, um, I, I see no good way out, and each of the steps that you talk about taking, I think, has a such an insignificant chance of working. Even if we make, we set up a no-fly zone, I'm very dubious that that really changes the balance of power on the ground. Um, you know, doing nothing is bad. Doing something that costs them a lot of money and is ineffective, that costs money, burns political capital, and is ineffective, is even worse. Um, and so I think the administration rightly sees that taking any step then puts you on a very slippery slope to the next steps. You can't have, once you have planes circling over Syria, you've kind of just assumed some responsibility for what's now going on on the ground. Because you could theoretically now with your planes up there, stop it. Um, so then we, then that, this carries us then into airstrikes or could very, very quickly. Um, and then what happens if that doesn't work? I mean, what if the, the reinforcements from the IRGC, from Hezbollah, from you know, Shia militias in Iraq, from, from wherever, really are strong enough to stand up to, to everything that we could do from the air? Now what do you do? We're running out of, a little bit of running out of time. I've got Tim and Lisa. We can combine these. 
Thank you. Um, Rosa, you spoke a lot about the legal frameworks. Um, I have a question with regard to how um, to organize the state in the new environment that we have threats coming from abroad. And the response, as you outlined, was that we more or less said that war is now the legal continuum rather than peace, and we have declarations of war. Um, and this response from the government bureaucracy is that the New York um, City police unit, for example, has gone international. You have DHS creating international corporation. You have either JSOC or CIA involved in drone strikes. You have Cyber Command with the dual-headedness with the NSA, where an intel agency is transforming it into a security agency. So we have all of these different um, trans institutional transformations in the government bureaucracy, which was set up along the lines of domestic and foreign. And that distinction no longer applies. So. Apart from the legal framework, how do you see, uh, and this is a question for all the panelists, how do you see that mirrored in the institutional framework, um, apart from the, from the legal side and actual the, the bureaucracy side? Okay, good question. And Lisa? Yeah, hi, Lisa Magarel from Open Society Foundations. I wanted to go back also to the legal framework and the choice that uh, the United States made, different than some other countries that faced similar attacks, um, but also to what Phil Mudd said about how this is uh, that cartels are bigger threat than terrorism. So what does that mean about the frame that you apply to big crime and uh, how the United States interprets and gets out of this frame if that's what we want to see, the military frame? Um, so it, it, with the juxtaposition of those two ideas is interesting to me. Does that mean that you start to apply a military frame to uh, the cartel problem in a way that hasn't been done before? Or how do you backtrack from the decision and the choice that the U.S. made uh, in those opening uh, moments? I think the choice is, I mean, we're in a different time. So I don't see this as a, I mean, we live through a continuum. In my analytic mind, this is not a continuum. We do not face a strategic threat from terrorism today. I'm not suggesting we use the same tools against uh, cartels that we use against terrorists. I'm suggesting there should be a discussion in terms of political context to say, if you want to take terrorism seriously, understand that if you have high school students or nieces and nephews, as I do, that what they face in a high school hall in terms of drugs and gangs pay, is, is far more significant than any terror threat. So let's have a serious conversation about where we spend our money. One final point. I, I don't buy that, that we view, I mean, in the age of globalization, you're going to have security services like the FBI and CIA work together. But what I witnessed in terms of the difference between how we conducted intelligence operations on U.S. soil against U.S. persons versus overseas continued in the 21st century to be night and day. I did not view what we did at the FBI as intelligence as I knew it. It was that profoundly different. So I, I would dispute that the, this two are sort of converging. I suppose in some ways they are, but in terms of the fundamental value of an American citizen deserves to live free or die, I saw that every day. Except if they're Anwar al -Awki. Well, I, I... Yeah, he forfeited his right. I actually would take a slightly different tack. I mean, the, the phenomenon I was talking about earlier is all people say, oh, it's the militarization of U.S. foreign policy, and then we see the militarization of all these domestic institutions. That's terrible. We need to put the military back in its box, and we need to give more money to the State Department. And, you know, and, I, and my reaction to that is, is actually often, you know, you could just as much see this as a civilianization of the military, if you will, you know, the, the, and these are, again, I, mean, I don't be too abstract here. We made up these categories. God did not say, you know, and there shall be a military and this is what it shall look like and it shall wear uniforms. And so, you know, we said, let's develop this category that we're going to call the military. We're going to develop a set of, you know, descriptive of its functions and role and uniforms and all this stuff. And let's set up this set of dividing lines between what you can do to this other, you know, what is a U.S. citizen or here in the territorial borders of the United States. We, we made that stuff up and we made it up for some functional reasons, right? Which is that we, and this is what I was referring to earlier when I said, uh, you know, as we see this kind of greater blurriness in our concepts of what's war, it has some real implications for our, our notion of civilian control of the military, which I would put it to you is a, is a construct that has been rendered almost meaningless um, simply because it's now completely arbitrary. What does it mean to say that people who don't wear uniforms have authority over the people who do if the control of the ability to use lethal force is no longer either solely in the possession of the military or no longer constrained in the ways it was? It seems to me that our, the more interesting and more, and more difficult question 
is in an era, in a globalized era, in an era in which there are all kinds of convergences, and there must be, because borders don't matter as much and so forth, there have to be. Um, how do we come up with some new set of institutions and rules that prevent what we really care about, which is, which is not military getting out from under civilian control, but which is the abuse of power by those who have it to harm those who don't. You know, that's what we should care about. That's what I care about. And that's a completely different question. I don't care if the military does everything, right? The military can, you know, make breakfast tomorrow morning. Right? It doesn't matter. You know, the, 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 issue, the, you know, the issue is how do we make sure we have some set of institutional, institutionalized, legalized constraints that protect against the abuse of power when there are concentrations of power. And that's a really different question from what institution with what label on it is doing what activities. I have very little to add to that. Okay, well great, that's good, but we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.